particular session, I would focus my lecture on the basic concepts of a single photograph. Photogrammetry is another branch of remote sensing, where the information on the ground is collected by a camera which is located on an aircraft. In this technique of data collection, the output is in the form of a photograph, where the camera used has some special characteristics. This characteristic allows for making measurements, which has a direct geometric relationship to the ground. The word photogrammetry has been derived from three Greek words. First is photos, meaning light. Second is gramma, meaning something drawn or written. And the third word is metron, which means to measure. Thus, the root words therefore originally signifies measuring graphically by means of light. On this basis, remote photogrammetry till recently has been defined as the science or art of obtaining reliable measurements by mean of photographs. Photogrammetry has two distinct areas of working, metric photogrammetry and interpretative photogrammetry. Metric photogrammetry which involves precise measurements and computations to determine shapes and size of objects while interpretative photogrammetry, which deals with the identification and recognition of objects from photographs and satellite images. In metric photogrammetry, the concept of measurement is implicit and is well understood simply by the term photogrammetry, whereas the interpretative photogrammetry includes photo interpretation as well as the new scientific tool called remote sensing. Photo interpretation involves systematic study of the photographic images for the purpose of identifying objects and deducing their significance and may be considered to be limited only to photographs only. Now, let us look at the advantages of photogrammetry. A photograph offers a synoptic view or bird's eye view of the area. It serves as a permanent record, which could be used at any time for examination and for comparison purposes, if procured periodically. Since a photograph contains all the information about the terrain or object, experts from different disciplines can examine the same photograph or imagery to extract information of their interest. A photograph serves as a more reliable research tool, since for any dynamic phenomena, they capture the movement instantaneously, thereby permitting correlation of measurements at different points. Another advantage is that if during investigations, additional points in the structure or object that has been photographed are needed. This can be obtained even if the actual structure has failed or has been dismantled. Photogrammetry has been proved to be fast, economical compared to conventional methods of measurements. Now, let us look at the classification of aerial photographs. Aerial photography can be classified based on the type of camera as frame, continuous strip and panoramic photographs. Considering only the frame photographs due to their frequent use in photogrammetry, classification can be made according to camera orientation format size, angular coverage and type of emulsion. So, first of all, let us look at classification on the basis of camera orientation. 
First, a vertical photograph is taken with a optical axis of the camera held in a near in a vertical or nearly vertical position as shown in the figure below. The second is a high oblique photograph which is taken with the optical axis deliberately tilted far enough from the vertical to show the earth's horizon. The third is a low oblique photograph with in which the camera axis is strongly tilted, but not enough to show the earth's horizon. The next type of photograph could be convergent photograph, which is a sequential pair of low oblique photographs, where the camera optical axes converge towards one another. Each photograph covers essentially the same portion of the ground as can be seen in the figure below. Usually, a vertical photograph is taken with the optical axis unintentionally tilted by a slight amount from the vertical. This is referred to as a tilted photograph. The unintentional tilt angle is usually less than 3 degrees. Now, let us look at the classification of photographs on the basis of the focal length and the format size. This particular table shows different types of photographs which can be taken. First is narrow angle, it has an angular coverage between 10 to 20 degrees with camera focal length of the order of 610 to 915 millimeters and it can be used for intelligence, general interpretation and mosaicing purposes. The next category is normal angle, where the angular coverage is between 50 to 70 degrees using camera focal lengths of the order of 210 to 300 millimeters. Well, this type of photograph can be used for interpretation mapping, color photography, preparation of mosaics and orthophotography. The next category is wide angle, wherein the angular coverage is ranging between 85 degrees to 95 degrees with a camera focal length of 153 millimeters. This is the most commonly used camera for photographic mapping of ground. Then we have ultra or super wide angle wherein the angular coverage is 110 degrees to 130 degrees with a camera focal length of about 88 millimeters and it can be used for mapping of areas where there is very little relief that is small height variations in the ground. Now, let us look at the classification of photographs on the basis of the emulsion used that is the type of film. So, under this we have four types of films which can be used. The first is panchromatic black and white. This is the most widely used type of emulsion for photogrammetric mapping and interpretation. Second is color film. Well, this emulsion is used for interpretation and is to a limited extent for mapping. It differentiates between hues to a much greater extent than a black and white photography. The next emulsion could be or the fill type could be a infrared black and white. Well, this emulsion is used for interpretation and intelligence. It penetrates haze more completely than panchromatic emulsion because of the longer wavelength. It is used to detect camouflage. It is seldomly used for mapping purposes. The fourth type of emulsion is the infrared color film or what we call it as the false color. Well, this emulsion is used for interpretation particularly in the analysis of plant and crop diseases, soil analysis and water pollution. Now, let us look at the classification of the photo 
of photogrammetry on the basis of the sensor system used. The classification of photogrammetry is done based on the type of sensor system used for getting the photograph or the image and these could be categorized as radar grammetry wherein the date equipment used or the sensor used is a radar. The next category is x-ray photogrammetry wherein we may use an x-ray photo uh, equipment to acquire the image. Third is hologrammetry wherein we will get holographs which is very commonly used nowadays in order to prevent violations of copyright of printed materials or equipments. The next is infrared or color photogrammetry wherein we use a infrared or a color camera. Then we look at the classification of photogrammetry on the basis of the geometry of cre recreation. When single photographs are used with the stereo effect if any produced by reflected mirror images it is called as monoscopic photogrammetry. When two overlap photographs are observed and measured or interpreted in a stereoscopic viewing device which gives us a three dimensional view and creates a mental impression of a relief model of the ground it is called as stereo photogrammetry. Then classification of photogrammetry on the basis of data reduction. Under this classification there are three processes known as instrumental or analog, analytical and digital. So, let us look at what actually is analog photogrammetry. In analog photogrammetry optical or mechanical based equipments are used to reconstruct 3D geometry from a pair of overlapping photographs. The main product is a topographical map. The picture below shows a typical analog equipment being used for mapping purposes using a pair of overlapping photographs. Next is analytical photogrammetry. In this a computer replaces some of the expensive optical and mechanical components. The devices are analog or digital or hybrid in nature. The output of analytical photogrammetry may be a photo topographical map, but can also be digital products such as digital maps or digital elevation models. Then we come to the third category and that is the digital photogrammetry. Digital photogrammetry is applied to digital images that are stored and processed on a computer. Digital photogrammetry is sometimes called as soft copy photogrammetry because here we do not have a hard copy rather than a image which is in digital in nature is available to the analyst for undertaking the process of computations. The output products are in digital form such as a digital map, DM and digital orthophotographs saved on the computer storage media. Having had a look at all the classification considering various factors, now let us look at some of the important definitions which will help us in identifying some of the commonly used terms as we progress through photogrammetry. The starting point of all photogrammetry is the central perspective projection. This type of projection is categorized by the fact that the rays joining the corresponding image and the object points all pass through one point which is known as the perspective center. The pinhole camera is the 
ideal physical analog of a truly prospective projection. Although modern optical technology is well advanced and produces lenses of high performance and good quality, the perfect lens has not been yet produced. The imperfections of a lens causes various abrasions, which affect the visual and metric qualities of a photograph. The magnitude of abrasion errors is considerably reduced by proper optical design. This is impossible to achieve in the design of a single element lens. Modern high performance photogrammetric lenses may contain of 6 to 11 optical elements. The concept of thin lens optical center through which all the rays pass fails here. The actual path of a ray of incident light through a photogrammetric lens is rather complicated, but a physical equivalence is possible if we conceive the existence of two nodes for such a lens system. The rays of light is supposed to be incident at n, which is the entry node on the optical axis and emerges from n dash on the optical axis. n and n dash are called as the entry and exit nodes respectively. Sometimes it is also referred to as the front and rear nodes. The figure below shows the represents the photography of ground according to a new or uh, according to the two node concept. Here what we can see is that a ray of light from object A, it falls on the photogrammetric lens whose front node is represented by N. After reaching this point, the ray of light moves along a straight line, which is connecting the front node to the exit node that is n dash. At this point, now depending on the angle of incidence of the ray coming from object A, the this particular ray now emerges from the exit node and goes and falls on the image plane and is represented by the point a small a here. One thing that we can see here is that the distance between the image plane and the exit or rear node is what we call it as the focal length of the camera. Since the distance between the two nodes is insignificant when compared to the distance of the object from the entry, but not insignificant compared to the distance of the image from the exit node, the exit node is regarded as the point of perspective photogrammetry. That is the point where the ray is now going to emerge from the lens. So, the figure can now be replaced by a new figure with the perspective center. These simplifications are valuable, since they permit us to use the well known geometrical and algebraic theorems of perspective projection for the measured techniques in photogrammetry. Now, let us move to define some of the important definitions. First is focal length. It is the distance of the rear nodal point of the lens to the plane of the photograph. In photogrammetry, the focal length is not directly measured. Instead, it is arrived at by computations based on calibration data. Thus, it is termed as calibrated focal length and belongs to the camera as a whole and not to the lens alone. The next important term is the principal point. The point 
in which the ray representing the camera axis pierces the photoplane is what we call it as the principal point of the of the photograph. The next is optical axis. Well, this is the line joining the front and the rear nodes. For all practical purposes, it is the line at right angles to the curvature of the lens. The next is camera axis. It is the ray of light normal to the photoplane in the object space and passing through the entry node. Fiducial marks or collimating marks. These are basically index marks usually four rigidly connected with the camera lens through the camera body and forming images on the photograph to which the position of the photograph can be referred to. Then is photograph center. Well, photograph center is the geometrical center of the photograph as defined by the intersections of the line joining the opposite fiducial marks. The origin m dash in this particular figure is the photograph m dash represents the origin of the photograph coordinate system and this point m dash is the photograph center. Then we come to format. Well, it is the planar dimension of the photograph that is we can say it is the size of the photograph. Normally in aerial photogrammetry or in photogrammetry the size of the image is not as to what we observe in our daily life from a simple camera, but here it is it could have a size of 23 by 23 centimeters or 18 by 18 or 15 by 15 centimeters, which is not the common size of a photograph. Next is photogram. Well, a photograph is termed a photogram if the bundle of rays of the object side at the moment of exposure can be reproduced. Now, let us look at the structure by virtue of which the aerial photographs are taken. Normally, aerial photographs when they are undertaken they have to be laid out in a specific manner. So, first of all let us look at what is photographic overlap. When aerial photograph is used for mapping flight lines are laid out on a flight map with a spacing that will cause the photographs to cover a common strip of ground. This overlap between flight strips is called side lap and amounts to about 25 percent of the width of the photograph. So, in this particular graphics shown below we can see that between two flight lines the crossed hashed out portion is the photographic overlap in the side direction or what we call it as the side lap. Each photograph in the flight line covers an area that overlaps the area covered by the previous photograph by about 60 percent. This overlap along the line of flight is called forward overlap or simple overlap. The large overlap between consecutive photographs serves three primary purposes. First of all it produces coverage of the entire ground area from two viewpoints such that the coverage being necessary for stereoscopic viewing and measuring. Two successively exposed photographs taken along a flight line are called a stereo spare of photographs. Second, it allows all but the central portion of each photograph to be discarded in the context in the construction of mosaics. Third, the small overlap area between alternate photographs is necessary for, exist, for extending the horizontal and vertical control 
by photogrammetric methods. Having looked at the layout of the photographs along the flight line and across the flight line, now let us look at the geometry of a single aerial photograph. A single photograph of an object taken with the camera axis normal to that plane is a true map of the object. Thus, a photograph of a wall or a face containing inscriptions or artistic paintings is an accurate map of these records if it is exposed with the camera axis perpendicular to the wall. Similarly, a truly vertical aerial photograph in which the camera axis coincides with the plumb line at the instant of exposure would be a map if the ground appearing on the photograph is flat and level. However, if the photograph is tilted or if the terrain contains relief, the aerial photograph will only be an approximate map of the terrain. The degree of approximation or the amount of deviation from a true map depends upon the amount of tilt and or relief. Each of these effects cause a displacement in the photograph with respect to the two map position and is called as tilt displacement and relief displacement respectively. When we look at a single photograph which is being substituted as a map then we need to determine what is the scale. So, let us look at the scale of a vertical photograph. The diagram adjoining shows the schematic layout of how the scale of a photograph is determined. In this particular diagram, we find the point where the camera is located in the air is designated by L and this is what we will call it as the camera exposure station from where the photograph has been taken. Well, this camera will be located at a specific height above the a ground datum and this is what we call it as the flying height. Well, this datum for simplicity should always be referred to as the mean sea level until otherwise specified differently. Similarly, the elevation of the ground above this datum is represented by the term small h. What we find that there are two objects A and B which have been photographed and they appear as small a and b on the photograph taken by the camera of the ground. The point where the plumb line intersects the photo plane is what we call it as the principal point and if this is a truly vertical photograph that is the camera axis coincides with the plumb line then this is also the photographic center and thus this will the point O will act as the coordinate origin of the coordinate system which will be used to find out the measurements of the points of interest. Based on this using simple geometry we can say that the scale of a vertical photograph can be given by S H is equal to small f divided by h minus small h, whereas s h is the foot scale of a photograph at a point whose ground elevation is small h. Capital H is the flying height above the datum and f is the focal length of the camera. When the scale of a photograph of a given area is referred to, the scale can be considered uniform over that only if the area lies at a constant elevation. Similarly, when reference is made to the scale along a line appearing on a photograph, 
it is presumed that the line on the ground lies at the same elevation through its length. Otherwise, the scale will change from point to point along the line. The datum scale of a photograph is that scale which would be effective over the entire photograph if all the points were projected vertically down to the datum before being photographed. The datum scale is given by the relationship S D and it is equal to small f divided by capital F, where the symbols correspond to those given for the previous equation. Now, it is possible that while we are taking photograph of an area that the ground may elevation may not remain constant. It may vary at different locations and thus what will happen is that the scale of the photograph at each of the points of varying height would be different. However, it is not possible to have multiple scale values for a photograph. So, for simplicity a average scale is defined. The average scale of a photograph is that which would be effective over the entire photograph if all the points were projected vertically upwards or downwards to the surface representing the average elevation of the terrain being photographed. The average scale is given by the relationship S A V is equal to small f divided by capital H minus H A V, where H A V is the average elevation of the area. The average scale computed from this equation is not effective for the entire area. This scale will be too small for areas whose elevations are greater than H A V and too large for areas whose elevations are less than H A V. The scale of a photograph can be determined by measuring the distance both on the photograph and the map between two well defined points and computing using the following relationship that is photo scale divided by the map scale is equal to the photo distance divided by the map distance. Having determined the scale of a aerial photograph, next is we need to identify the ground coordinates of different points which are located on the photograph. So, let us look at the diagram besides wherein a photograph has been taken from a position capital L having a focal length of f and wherever the plumb line or the optical axis passes through the image plane that point is what we call it as the principal point and with respect to this the photographic axis system will be defined. The photographic coordinate system should be coincident with the ground coordinate system which is there. Let the origin of the ground coordinate system at O lies directly below the exposure center L it is desired to determine the ground coordinates of two points A and B whose elevations are H A and H B respectively. The points small a and small b are the corresponding photographic images whose measured coordinates are X A Y A and X B and Y B and the ground coordinates are represented by capital X A y a and capital X b and capital y b. Then by similar triangles what we can find is that the coordinates of X a can be correlated to the fundamental elements of the photograph that is the flying height, the focal length and the height of that particular point and can be expressed as X a is equal to h minus small h a divided by f multiplied by the photographic coordinate of x a represented by lower case. Similarly, y a that is the y 
coordinate of point A can be expressed as capital H minus small h A divided by the focal length and multiplied by the y coordinate on the photograph of point A. Similarly, the coordinates of the other points can also be determined. So, we can say that the coordinate of point B can be expressed by x B and y B and where x B is equal to capital H minus small h B divided by small f multiplied by x B which is the photographic coordinate with respect to the center of the photograph and y b is equal to h minus h b dash h b divided by focal length multiplied by y b. So, based on this now we can generalize the relationship for the ground coordinates of any point by the following equation that is the ground coordinate x can be correlated to the flying height h minus the elevation of that particular point divided by the focal length of the camera and multiplied by the photographic coordinate of that part x coordinate of that particular point. Similarly, the y coordinate of a point can be correlated to h minus small h divided by small f that is the focal length multiplied by the y coordinate of that particular point. Having determined the ground coordinates, our next task is to identify at what elevation the camera actually has been placed while taking the photograph. That is, we would like to find out what is the flying height of the camera. So, let us determine the flying height. For this, we need to identify certain points on the ground and their corresponding positions on the photograph. So, the flying height can be determined from a known distance on the ground between the two points which can be positively identified on the photograph. The elevations of these two points must also be known. Pythagoras theorem we know that the distance between two points whose ground coordinates are known, the distance can be expressed as the square of the differences of the x coordinates of the two points plus the square of the y coordinates of the two points and taking the square root one gets the distance between the two points. So, using this particular concept now substituting the values of x a and x b and y a and y b from the previous equations wherein the ground coordinates have been determined, the distance between a between a set of points can now be written in this particular manner, wherein the square of the distance is nothing but now it can be represented as h minus h b divided by f multiplied by small x b minus h minus h a divided by f multiplied by x a and whole square plus similarly for the y point where it and again taking the whole square we can now find out what we will now find is that this on simplifying it reduces to the form of the quadratic equation a h square plus b h plus c is equal to 0 where a b and c represent numbers obtained by substituting known values in the expression of d square. The solution of the quadratic equation can now be expressed as h is equal to minus b plus under root of b square minus 4 a c divided by 2 a. The next parameter that we really need to look at is the relief displacement. A vertical photograph except under rare circumstances does not have a constant scale. Every point on the photograph is displaced from its datum position because of its elevation being above or below the datum. This displacement is called the relief displacement. This particular diagram 
conceptualizes the relief displacement on an aerial photograph. If we look at this particular diagram, a point A is lying above the datum, a ground point A is lying above a datum at an height of h A. Now, when a camera which is vertically looking down images this particular point, what happens is that this particular point is now imaged at a location small a. However, since this is a perspective geometry, so what has happened is that if one looks at the planimetric position, had this point been lying on the datum, it would had been imaged at a location a dash rather than a. Now, if I move this particular point ground point a from the datum to its original height h a, this particular point will start to shift its position on the image and move along a particular direction which would be radial from the center of the photograph and would appear at this particular point a. So, this movement which has taken place because of the ground point rising from the datum to its actual elevation is what we call it as the relief displacement and can be expressed as the distance represented by the points a a dash. Similarly, if we have another point b at a elevation of h b, then it will be having a depending on its height, it will have its displacement on the image. What we find that is that whenever this displacement takes place above the datum, the displacement is outward and what we can say is that if this displacement is correlated with respect to the center of the photograph, then we may find that the distance of the point A when it is lying on the datum is represented by A dash, this B represented as R dash and similarly, the point A at its original height h A is being represented by A on the image, then this distance from the center of the photograph can be expressed as R. Using these information, what we can find is that we can now postulate certain geometric relationships that is considering the triangles capital L O A and capital L capital O capital A, we find that from this f divided by h minus small h is equal to small r divided by capital R, where capital R is the ground distance of the point from the center of the coordinate ground coordinate system. Or similarly, when we try to look at the point which is a representing the point on the datum, then this can be expressed as f capital H which is equal to R dash over capital R and thus what we can using these equations we can say that the relief displacement R is equal to capital R multiplied by f divided by h minus h a or in case of r dash this would be capital R f over capital H divided by capital H or we can say that r is equal to small r multiplied by capital H minus small h divided by f or r could be equal to r dash capital H divided by f. From this, we can now compute the relief displacement of a particular point and 
this particular relief displacement can be now expressed by the equation that is that if the distance between the ground point at the datum and the ground point at its elevation f, this is represented as d and we call this as the relief displacement, then relief displacement can be equated to by the equation to be r over f divided by h capital H minus small h. So, this way we can find out what is the displacement that a point undergoes due to its elevation and when we are preparing a map these corrections can be made out. Many a times what happens is when the photography is taking place the due to many factors it is not possible to maintain the camera axis coincident to the plumb line and thereby what happens is it moves away from the vertical and it is now at a small angle which we call it as the tilt of the camera. A tilted aerial photograph, a plumb line dropped from the exposure station L through the photograph to the ground defines the photo nadir point small n and the ground nadir point capital N. The angle between the plumb line and the optical axis capital L small o is the angle of tilt represented by small t. The angle measured in the plane of the photograph from the positive photographic y axis clockwise to the another point side of the principal line is the swing angle s that is this is the amount by which the information would turn round. The bisector of the tilt angle that is capital L i intersects the principal line n o at a point i and it is called as the isocenter of the photograph. A line perpendicular to the principal line and passing through the isocenter is known as the axis of the tilt. The axis of the tilt as well as any line perpendicular to the principal line is a horizontal line. So, let us look at the scale of a tilted photograph. In order to determine the scale of a particular point on a tilted photograph, not only must the elevation of the point be known, but its position on the photograph must be known with respect both the axis of tilt and the principal line, because the tilt takes place in the direction of the principal line. The positions of the principal line and the nadir point, which is on the downward half of the photograph are fixed by the angle of swing. To determine the scale of a tilted photograph at a point, it is therefore necessary to know the angle, the tilt and the swing, flying height, focal length and the elevation of that point. Let P be a point lying at an elevation h p above the datum. The image of the point appears on the tilted photograph at p dash. The principal point is at o and the nadir point is at small n. The angle of swing is shown here as s. Let the positive y axis be rotated till the new y axis and or the y dash axis coincides with the principal line having a positive direction as shown. The rotation is considered positive if in an counterclockwise direction as in analytical geometry, then scale at p of a tilted photograph is given by the relationship s t is equal to focal length f multiplied by the secant of the tilt angle minus y dash multiplied by the sine of the tilt angle divided by flying height capital H minus the elevation of the point small h. 
Similarly, having computed the scale, then we can compute the ground coordinates of a tilted photograph. Similarly, to the procedure that we have already discussed for a vertical photograph, here the ground coordinate x would be equal to capital H minus small h divided by the focal length into the secant of the tilt angle t minus y dash sin of the tilt angle t multiplied by x dash. Similarly, y could be now expressed as capital H minus small h divided by the focal length multiplied by the secant of the angle of tilt minus y dash multiplied by the sin of the tilt angle t multiplied by the y coordinate of the on the image plane. Similarly, we can find out the relief on a tilted photograph. The relief displacement of a point on a tilted photograph with respect to its datum has been shown in the figure in the adjoining figure. The exposure station which is at capital L, the focal point is at small o and the nadir point is at n, the isocenter is at i and the focal length is L o. The relief displacements a dash a and b dash b are seen to lie along point lines which radiate from the nadir point. A tilted photograph and a corresponding vertical photograph taken with the same focal length and from the same flying height will match along the axis of tilt where the where they intersect one another. At any other point on the tilted photograph the image of the point will be displaced either outward or inward with respect to its equivalent position on a vertical photograph. If the point lies on the half of the photograph upwards from the axis of tilt, it will be displaced inwards and if the point lies on the downward half, it will be displaced outwards. This displacement which radiates from the isocenter. Tilt displacements are usually quite small and can be ignored. These displacements are rigorously accounted for in analytical photogrammetry and in the use of stereoscopic plotting equipments. In my next lecture, I would take up the concepts of a pair of overlapping photographs so that 3D based observations can be made. Thank you. Mm -hmm.